So, when I started to contact people to be on this channel, I never in my wildest dreams thought that Mats Gustafsson would answer my email uh, and let alone be on this channel talking about records. This this is a dream come true again. I mean, this is this is I'm I'm blown away that I've had this conversation because Mats Gustafsson is not only a fantastic musician and a fantastic collector of records, but he's just a great friendly guy with so much knowledge so having this conversation with him is great and i'm so glad that i can uh, that i can share this with you guys with these chats these conversations i try to be as relaxed as possible i don't want to edit anything out like this is a conversation between two music and record nerds and i want it to be like that i don't push any questions i, I let them lead the conversation and i try not to be uh, too big of a fanboy if you know <laughs> if you know what i mean but i think that we get sort of a very good like nice relaxed conversation uh, conversations with the musicians i've talked to and also stay at the, till the uh, till the very end because about in the middle of the conversation he uh, announces sort of a box set that will be out uh, next year that will blow people's minds and he also uh, at the end of the conversation uh, actually releases information of a recording of a very famous jazz musician not living today that is sort of a little bit controversial so so stay to the end uh, and and watch the entire interview but you will have no problem with doing that because listening to Mats for an hour i could you could listen to Mats for for hours and hours talking about records and music so yeah so glad to uh, to be able to uh, to share this oh yeah and thank you so much Mats for for uh, for doing this obviously <laughs> okay here we go Okay, so hi everyone, and uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today, and thank you, uh, Mats, for uh, taking uh, this his time off to to uh, talk a little bit about uh, music and and records in particular. Hi, Mats. Hi. Yeah, hi. Happy to be here. <laughs> how, uh, how are how how are life treating you? You are a hectic uh, sort of a, a guy. Are you on tour right now? I'm home in yeah. my cave in my archive with my family <laughs> okay uh, that's... Uh, it, it's a very, it's a very hectic period right now actually i mean it's a it's a very bizarre i think everyone is having the same experience with post covid life uh, so it, it's still extreme tempo everything is supposed to happen at the same time okay. all the time and uh, it's kind of hard to to find a to find a break, but uh, yeah. family and the record archive is uh, helping, you know, okay. uh, to, to feel Hoping, a bit like... chill and relaxed and uh, regaining the energy. So, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's yeah, a lot of reasons to have these records. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, so, so uh, yeah. Uh, I was just going to, to ask the, the question that I think that everyone is is sort of wondering, and that is how many vinyls per day keeps the doctor away? We, we, we need <laughs> the answer. One. At least one. At least uh, one, okay. I mean, for, for me, it is, it is a truth, actually. It's, uh, I need a constant uh, refill somehow, you know. Okay. Uh, in order to, to keep to keep sane. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. The the is it just like enough with music, or is it living the sort of the vinyl life? Is that what you crave? Uh, if you understand what I I'm aiming at. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, this <laughs> this discussion always comes up, of course, and. Uh, the obvious answer is always music comes first, you know, yep. and it is, but the, the, there is a certain value of the object in many different perspectives, I would say. Uh, sure. And for me, it's, uh, we can talk about this for hours, but. Uh, yeah, sure. 
the, the objects makes me feel good you know it makes me yeah. as i said before also to regain my energy and i feel relaxed when i can sit in my in my room listening to records and you know make the the active choices yeah. what to listen to next and you have all this chain of associations and stuff and i love it you know yeah. i can't get enough and uh, the day when i feel bored or then I will get rid of <laughs> I will get everything. Rid of okay. I, I feel like that like vinyl is not only a physical medium, but also a physical sort of experience for me, at least, because when I play records, when I play vinyl records, I feel it in my gut. Like it's almost like, uh, I don't know, being in love or something like that. <laughs> sort of that tingling in the stomach when you, I, I don't know, I, I don't feel the same way with CDs and and uh, and st streaming. It's just like, uh, I mean, I don't know. I love a fair of sorts. Sure, it's, it's uh, thank God we're not doing this uh, in public. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so if, if it's okay for you, can, can we go uh, back to the be beginning? Like who, who are Mats Gustafsson? Where did you start as a musician? And when did the sort of the, the discoholic uh, sickness take over? It's a very healthy sickness. No, I mean, uh, yeah, I grew up in Umeå and... Uh... I was a lot into sports and stuff, you know, when you're young, but music kicked in very early. Uh, my mom had some little Richard records that totally kicked my ass. And I was not all, I mean, I guess seven or eight or something. And I, I wanted to have all the records by little Richard. That was like the starting point of my disco list. actually. I, and of course, you're not aware of the, the consequences no. back then, you know. But it, it, it was an important start. I mean, I still, that's my only hero in a way, musically, okay. uh, funny enough. But uh, I still think when, when I look back now, I, I think the, the fact that he was using a lot of saxophones on his early recordings, the specialty recordings in the 50s, uh, that triggered something inside of me uh, okay. that I didn't know at, at that point. And then... I fell in love with the saxophone when I heard Sonny Rollins live in Umeå, my hometown. They have a great jazz festival still going on. Yeah. And I think I was 14 when I heard him. Uh, and I just, I just had to play the saxophone. Okay. Uh, cool. And I was, I was already involved in like punk rock stuff locally in Umeå. And the saxophone felt like a very logic uh, way to go because it was much louder than the flute that yeah, I was playing yeah. on. Okay. Electric piano and flute, which is kind of odd in in punk rock circles in a way, I guess, but it made sense then. Uh, and with a saxophone, I could be much louder. Okay. Uh, so that's where it started, you know, and I, I mean, I never, I never really got any lessons and I, I have no academic background or anything to fall back on. And I'm very happy for that. Yeah, uh, I have to say on, on all levels. But how, how uh, did you sort of uh, how did you um, learn to play the saxophone? Was it just like sitting down practicing all the time, or did you listen to the records and try to Im imitate what you heard? Uh, it was really a trial and error. And uh, I, I had Jonas Knutson, saxophone player in uh, also from Umeå. Great saxophone player, super great guy, and uh, he helped me out in the very beginning with fingerings and stuff, you know, oh, very okay. basic. Uh, but then I I just figured it out, and I made all all the mistakes you can do in the beginning, of course. But it was it was kind of fun uh, to try to find out on your own, and of course listening to records and trying to to imitate and and repeat what you hear is a really really great method in order to develop your language. The only important thing is to remember that to only imitate is not a good way of making music. Okay. So that's no. a huge difference. It's a good learning process, but yeah. it's terrible when it comes to uh, expressing yourself. Because for me, music is expressing yourself, okay. what you feel, who you are. And in order to do that, you need to have a, a personal language. Yeah. 
and that you have to build up on your own and you can use bits and pieces from anything you know and uh, now if you look at saxophone players i was like listening a lot to whatever Coltrane, eiler brutzman changed everything for me okay and that also gave me the connection to the the energy of the punk rock stuff and the garage music in a way uh but you need to try to learn as much as you can and then in a way throw it away and build up your own language yeah so that was my that was my university and my university continued when i moved down to stockholm and i i met up with this amazing person harald hult yeah, who harald. was running yeah blue tower records and andreas and we became really close friends and uh, I was teaching him about free jazz experimental music and he was teaching me everything he knew about jazz basically so yeah. that was an amazing learning experience that i could never have achieved in in the academic circles so to speak yeah. uh, so i'm i'm very happy I, I went that way it it might have taken longer time you know to develop my my sure. technique but on the other hand i felt completely free you know to go any, anywhere i wanted and do all the mistakes i was doing and then just building up my language in a way from my mistakes yeah actually uh, and after some years i understood clearly that i need to improve my basic techniques okay, <laughs> uh, okay. but at that point it was not so difficult to to go back in little to rewind a little bit and then build it up so oh, okay but i mean yeah i mean the, the records they were always there and they are still here <laughs> yeah so for me it's not just the the hunt and the collecting it's uh it's inspiration and it's information yeah yeah and whenever i want to be inspired i it's great to hear live music, but I live on the countryside, so I don't hear much live music where I live. Uh, so it's always been like that. So I go to records and I, I, I search for something and maybe I don't find it, but I find something else and then yeah. I can move on, you know. And uh, uh, for me, mm -hmm. it's, it's really, I mean, of course, you can go online and you can find shit online, but the truth of, of a one-click truth yeah, it it doesn't oh. do it for me, and it needs you know it, it, this is a long and in a way philosophical discussion, but That's I really point. believe it should take time. You know, it yeah. needs to take time. Yeah, to to reach uh, the essence and to go deeper, you can't find it by one or two clicks. It's no. impossible. You you need to do the research on your own or together with colleagues and friends and stuff, but it's very much up to yourself to to do the research and my yeah. research has been to very high extent through my to, to through vinyls to, through records and the search is not over <laughs> no no it's not it's uh, i think that the struggle or the the sort of the investment of time that you do uh makes the sort of uh i don't know the word for it um uh, uh, be, be learning <laughs> in Swedish, yeah. yeah, so much greater uh, when you when you uh, put that needle down on in into the groove and starting to listening uh, to it, and then I mean, all collectors are on different level, I guess. Um, there's as many ways of collecting records as there are record collectors, I I I, I guess. But do you still find in 2022? Do you still find like? Uh, hunting for records fun or have you like reached a point in your collection when you think like now I have have everything it's it's a leading question because the answer is no <laughs> exactly I have everything no, yeah it, it, I'm it done never, it never fucking ends it never oh. ends oh. I, mean, I think I have good knowledge I have good knowledge oh. in experimental music and free jazz especially free music but there's still stuff i'm not aware of yeah and i love that feeling of someone telling me or some someone writing me have you heard this blah 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 and like yeah. what what is that or i mean i i i trade a lot we yeah. can go back to this later of course but trading is 
the best you can do with your clothes on, basically. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I agree. The records because the price levels these days are ridiculous yeah. in certain areas. We know that. Yeah. So the way to get records is to trade for them. And since my discoholism is kind of a uh, public <laughs> public yeah. knowledge and yeah. thing because of the books I did and all the interviews and shit, uh, people actually offer trades. Yeah. And there's been a few like uh, really great acetates that I've been managed to trade into my archive with groups and musicians that I had and actually, in those cases, the, the last couple of uh, records that I I, uh, I got, I don't even know who the musicians are. Okay, and that makes it that makes it really really interesting. Shit. So, but could you I like? Have them, I have them laying around here. It's like a guy in the U.S. got in touch and asked me if I was interested in. A record by J.R. Mitchell Quintet. And J.R. Mitchell is a kind of an unknown drummer, but he made some really great free jazz records in the late 60s. And he always played with Bayard Lancaster, who is a fantastic saxophone player. And I said, that, this is really weird. Super Hipster is the first track. That's a good name. <laughs> good uh, title. So I managed to trade this with, with this guy. Uh, it was a Tough trade, but a yeah. fair trade. Okay. And now I'm trying to figure out who is actually playing on this record. So I've been sending out sound clips to some really good friends and discoholics and, okay. and, and colleagues, and yeah. I'm waiting for answers. And I also recently uh, achieved uh, two acetates with something called the duplex trio. Three, okay. And, and this is completely mysterious. This is recorded obviously in the mid 60s in new york at plaza sound studios rockefeller center uh, and there's only titles on the on the labels but there's no information about musicians or blah 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 oh yeah and i don't really recognize it and i've been sending it out and people they have the same reaction it rings a bell like duplex i heard it but i don't know and there's nothing online it's a complete mis and music is really great. Oh, yeah, music okay. It's fantastic. Yeah, I was going to it ask is... that is, is the is the music as good as the rarity of the record like? Uh, it, this is sometimes true mm. with rare records. Yeah. Uh, in this case the Jerry Mitchell record one side is absolute masterpiece and the other side is a bit uh, too spiritual jazz-ish for, okay. for my taste. Mm. I know people love that, uh, but I like it to be a bit more open, a bit more frictions in the music. Yeah. And the duplex trio is completely mysterious. They're using elements from Middle Eastern music and mm. yeah, it's free, but it's still jazz. So okay. it is, this is like so it's... bad. My mentor Harald Hult, who taught me everything, he loved this kind of things. The okay. way you actually don't know who is playing. Yeah. And it's a rare object, and like trying to figure out who is it. He was a yeah. master in okay, up. but he's he passed away four years ago, so I can't really ask him any longer. Oh, <laughs> oh no, and that was tragedy, really. It's it's awesome yeah. that they keep on going with uh, with Andreas. Uh, I I had the opportunity. I live on the west coast in Sweden, so so uh, I'm not in in Stockholm uh, like every week. But I had the opportunity to to visit the shop like two three times, something like that. When ha uh, Harald had uh, the shop, um, so oh, yeah. it was awesome, really. Did we meet there? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. No, uh, I went there with uh, a buddy of mine called uh, Anders Alén. He's a guitar player in in Stockholm. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, I know him. Uh, so, um, so we went there, but but um, uh, yeah, yeah, tragedy, really. Um, shop, shit. shop is still going on. So it's, yeah, uh, yeah, it's still still going on. I see see it on. Uh, I haven't been to Stockholm for years. We went there last summer, I think, with my family. But we we had to go to the you know the Vasa Museum and all that sort of yeah, tourist yeah, uh, thing. So I actually I I rented one of those um sco electrical scooters and I just head off. I had like maybe 20 minutes, a half an hour, and and I went to Record Mania. So I spent my 
half an hour record digging at uh, record mania they weren't open but i i knocked on the door so he let me in <laughs> it was really nice no, i mean i have to say i mean i lived in stockholm for 20 years and it's still it's still my hometown in a way you know it's the town yeah. i know the best and uh, i have to say and this is public knowledge i mean in europe there's no better nope. city for record hunting no nope. sure that, but, yeah. i mean Actually, in all fields of music, I would say, uh, not just jazz, but it's amazing how many shops are still there and, and there's still new shops opening up. Some goes away, of course, but uh, it's pretty remarkable. I go there tomorrow, so I feel excited about okay, some hunting. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a list of questions and stuff like that, but it feels like it's uh, <laughs> almost unnecessary to ask something. Uh, okay. Shoot. Yeah, um, so, so your approach to music, before we leave the, the music totally, um, because it's uh, talking to you uh, as a musician, it's it's uh, it would be unfair not to ask questions about your music. Um, do, do, you, do you believe that, that uh, the music you create is entertainment or is it art? Is it political or is it just noise? That was the question that I, I wrote. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a good. It's a good question. I mean, and that that's a huge dividing line in why you make music. And for me, music is political. Yes, hundred yeah. percent. And music is never about entertainment. I I that's uh, very strong. And if if okay. if I would have start to feel in a different way, I would do some com completely different kind of music. I mean, music okay. for me to make improvised music is. And more and more, I have this feeling to make improvised music, which is about communication, improvisation, yeah. uh, resistance, is a political act in it in itself. You know. Yes. And if people likes to play background music, jazz or whatever sleazy pop or techno, or whatever, just yes, to please the masses, they can do that. It's fine. Mm. You know, whatever yeah. floats your boat. But music is much more important. I mean. Who was it? Derek Bailey, who said, "Music is music is like living, but better." Okay, that's a good quote. But it, it, it yeah. I mean, it's uh, music is everything. I mean, for me, and and uh, yes, think... it's it's very political, and and it it has to be. And I, I think the times we're living in right now, exactly, we don't have really have to discuss it in detail but it's completely fucked up yeah yeah I mean, definitely uh, it's insane and pandemic i talked with i talked talk, uh, with, uh, talk with dennis lixian uh just two weeks ago i think i did a, did a similar interview and we talked it was the day after uh the elections here in in sweden uh, <laughs> Great. so so but not to to go into detail about that but we talked a little bit about this sort of because you said that you 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 um, picked up the the saxophone because that was the sort of loudest uh, instrument and i feel like with dennis it's uh, his his way of singing is almost like in refuse at least he screams out the words and it feels like maybe that's how you have to communicate uh, to get your voice heard so when i listen to your saxophone playing i feel like i mean there's a lot of feelings frustration uh, anger but also beauty um uh, but it's loud I, I don't know where i'm going with this but it's it's <laughs> i mean it's definitely no, it, it, political it does, i mean it doesn't have to be loud i i think the the main Energy is a crucial parameter. It's okay. always been the most crucial parameter for me. But energy does not mean loud, you know. No, that's when true. you go that's down true. and play in a more low dynamic, but you keep the energy, then shit really happens. I mean, to oh, play okay. loud, easy, you know. You play guitar or you play keyboard or whatever, you can just turn the volume up. Yeah. You play saxophone, you just play louder. It's easy to play loud. It's hard to play soft and keep the energy. Yeah. And for me, it's it's all about frictions. You say something, and the other musicians or the other musicians respond needs to answer on yeah. on what you just said in various ways. It doesn't make sense just to imitate. Yeah. You have to 
communicate. You have to say something, and then the the dialogue continues, you know, and you build up something that is unique and might mean something to people. That's how I. That's how my life changed, you know, when I understood the mechanics of of improvised music is all about sharing. Okay. And when it's okay. about sharing, it's it it can never be about entertainment for me, you know. No. No. Uh, entertainment is something completely completely different. So I think that's a common I look around, I mean it's a common thread in, in my collection that there is resistance, there's friction in in almost I would say all, almost all the music I have around me here, if yeah. it's ethnic music or or rock music, garage, jazz, even I mean even you go back to New Orleans and swing music, there it, in the beginning there was resistance, you know, there was yeah. action, something was happening, sure. uh, and if something I really have problems with is like, like when when music goes into this post this and post that and yeah. it just repetition very a very small percentage is actually taking a tradition and and put putting it somewhere else and and make something uh, unique out of it uh it, it's a tricky it's a tricky time in a way music yeah. because it i had a lot of these discussions with harald because it feels like sometimes it feels like everything has been done you know okay what can you do you know yeah but, yeah yeah uh, i think yeah, I, I bet. I think the key is really the personal language and what you express and in what situations you do that. Okay. Because I I get invited to different projects all the time and uh, sometimes I get approached, can you play a solo on this recording and do this and that? And I'm not really interested in that. No. Uh, because I want to express myself. I want to do my own music, not just make a saxophone solo on no. on the recording i want to collaborate i want to meet so very few times i did i did recordings at home and send the file and okay. then you know you can mix it together yeah but that's always exceptions and it it has to be someone that i really love working with or really yeah. feel respect for and and all that so it's uh yeah music music is political and it's a necessity for life definitely yeah do, do you uh, do you um, uh, get inspiration from other art forms like paintings or movies and uh, uh, or um, uh, literature uh, or is it just, no way. just music <laughs> no th th this is also key i mean and that that was also very obvious in the beginning but my, my best friend is a painter edward jarvis okay we're still best friends uh, we grew up together, you know, we experienced all the the music, the girls, the yeah. booze, like everything together up in Umeå. But what was really, really interesting, I mean, he, he is a painter and he was a painter when he was born. Uh, we did a lot of research together doing really weird and probably very bad like performance pieces, action pieces with music and acting kind of, you know. Yeah. Uh, so for me, that was something very natural from the beginning to do this research, both in music and art, action, performance art. Yes. Uh, and I, I got drawn into that and I connected with Fylkingen in Stockholm really yep. early. And uh, my ex-wife is a choreographer and blah, blah, blah. It, it's... It's all a living organism. I, I, need, I need this input, you know, from... Yeah. from or, and it, it's interesting with... The process of, of life or the process of your artistic life some some periods i am much drawn into film yeah or literature or visual art or blah 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 right now it's i can't get enough of, of, of reading like poetry yeah okay for me, for me that's a huge thing right now i uh, and I, I can't get enough of it and of, of course i'm a collector too so like especially Swedish uh, poetry books are very collectible yeah. and very, it, it's a great feeling collecting them yeah. uh, because yeah. you can still find them and not too expensive because that's also something with, with vinyls that 
as I said before, a lot of the records we are looking for is just too expensive. Yeah. A normal person yeah. can't afford it. You need to be rich, you know, yeah. to buy low note first pressings yes. that I love. Yeah. Or, or Sun Ra records, you know, I love yeah. Sun Ra. I remember to, to today... Buy... I started to to um, uh, to think about a, a time when uh, I went to Runt Runt in Stockholm, that uh, uh, store, and they had natural music by uh, Frippe. And I think they wanted like 2,000 Swedish crowns for it or something like that. And I was like, I had never spent that money on that record or uh, on any record at that time. Uh, so I didn't buy it. And today it's like, it's, way up on my want list and if i'm going to get it i have to trade for it i mean i can't i can't buy it anymore it's it's too late pr for, prices, for on, prices on bar notes has skyrocketed in yeah. the last couple of years it's really like nothing else in a way uh, no. and I mean, but it takes I mean, off everything but, doesn't it in in when collecting huh? jazz, it ticks off everything. Like it's it's a it's rare. It there's different sort of pressings and music on them, uh, and it's great. I mean, it's it's like the the entire package. It feels like that anyway <laughs> with bird notes. The whole, I mean, it's it's really the whole package because the music is sensational. It's the music is absolutely fantastic, and yeah. the cover is I mean, yeah. The cover is something else. Shit! Here we go. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, this is the the classic cover yep. of natural music, and I, this I can talk for hours about because yeah. I'm I'm producing a four LP box of Bank Nordstrom right now with a Luxembourg German producer. Uh, no way! It's a film. It's four LPs. It's an EP. It's a ten inch. I'm, I completed the, the complete uh, discography of our notes. Okay, okay. It only, okay. Took, it only took five years to do it because it's a nightmare. It's a dream yeah, I, nightmare I for bet, a I bet it's a nightmare. There's like almost 40 different matrix sides. Okay. And they combine them all in different ways. So it, it's hell on earth to try yeah. to figure out. I have everything. Finally, I traded for and I got everything. Uh, I, cool. got, I got from Harold. I have most of the metal masters okay. for the bar notes. So I could figure out how many copies were actually made because people don't know this. And now everything will go public, of course, now when the when the box is out. Yeah. So I'm super excited because wow, shit, that's uh, awesome. Almost no one knows about this guy. No. They, they know no. he was producing the first Albert Island record, but exactly. that's about it. I have this. It's still like it, it, this is the only sort of flip record I I, uh, I have, and this is still pretty easy to to find. I I guess yeah, yeah. so that people can pick this up. Yeah, but that's, that's that's a great record. Yeah, yeah and I it love it. Really, it shows him where he was, like in the eighties, uh, and the, but the whole Bardo thing. What makes it so special is like it's all sixties, nineteen sixty two or sixty nine. Yeah. And it's basically all him playing solo. So this is way before Braxton, Evan Parker, like all those. This is years before they did solo recordings. Yeah. Uh, so it, it makes it historically also super interesting and unique. And it's something that very few people know about. So I, I'm very, very excited to see what the reactions will be yeah. from this. Uh, people so in course, this. I mean, Bird yeah. Forever about yeah yeah awesome i, I thought of, of like uh if it's okay with you I'll, I'll just show some records and see if you have any sort of connection with them uh records from my own collection um is this and if you want if you want if you want to trade if you want no. to trade a record let me know man okay yeah i'll i'll probably <laughs> hold you responsible <laughs> that I... uh but I, I'll, I don't know if I have anything. I have, um, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll talk after this. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this yeah. one, this is. I bought this pretty early in, in Stockholm, also for uh, 100 Swedish crowns. I think it's still the sticker from uh, House of Oldies. I 
think at least oh, yeah. uh, the, the, from from households but um I mean, you, you you know this record, surely. Yeah, you know this record. It's amazing, Fantastic. such an amazing, energetic record. Yeah. No, it's really great. I mean, it's fantastic. And I mean, Coltrane showed the way, you know, okay. in a way. Yeah. And, and he was so well known, so a lot of people were picking up his stuff. And of course, a lot of people got very confused when he started to free shit up after Love Supreme, which is now when you hear it, it's kind of pretty inside you know yeah. but when he did interstellar space and expressions people lost it you know yeah. a lot of people couldn't yeah. handle his 60s stuff at all but I, I he he is very very important for like opening this whole the whole jazz music up you know to 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 go into more yeah frictions and energy and yeah. and uh, spirituality too you know it's it's uh, it's an emotional music. I mean, I remember listening, especially that record was there was one of the first Colton records, if not the first, maybe. Uh, I, I got like stomach pain. It was so emotionally, I couldn't hardly listen to it. Okay. It, it just yeah, it's an intense record. Burning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's also like when you then you, you scratch, scratch the surface and then you start to look for similar things and there's like there's shitloads of great records with uh, oh the Rashid Ali yeah the, the, like the Rashid Ali Frank Lowe duo for instance yeah. which is done a couple of years Fantastic. also amazing you know but uh, that's the beauty of looking for stuff that you can you, you, you will always be able to find stuff you know I found this killer finish saxophone and drum duo okay 1969 ah. with the Juno and Seppo Leine. Ah, okay. they made one, one record on Emma Numinen's label at ah. pain shit. very limited very small edition I'm sure it didn't sell shit and it was no. super radical super political about uh, the, the, the Russian uh, uh, revolution okay basically and they, they were actually taking roles like one is playing like one is playing as a symbol for the workers and the other one is playing for the bourgeois yeah, side yeah. of things <laughs> super radical. i i did not know of this music until like two years ago and now i'm producing a reissue because i can't yeah behave myself because no I no think no it's so you great have to let it out to the people <laughs> like the people have to know about this you know yeah yeah exactly oh, shit um i i came i came into jazz uh via metal like i, I think in a way not many people maybe but but it's it's um i i i read some so, sort of like um metal magazines and stuff like that and uh, some of them had this on lists like of the most heavy heavy music you could listen to so and obviously the, the cover artwork sparked my interest you know so i went into yeah. sword and and then on we went like um have have you collaborated with with sorn or or uh, uh, worked in any way with we with... never we never worked together i know him since late 80s actually and we, okay. we kept in touch always great to meet up with him and i, I think he's still doing great stuff yeah i would love to hear him playing more you know okay uh, yeah. to play his sax and do that stuff i mean i love his early stuff he's crazy like the free impress stuff and then yeah. i mean naked city and torture garden and all this stuff is extraordinary and i have to tell you when me and harold started to import records mm. all around the world basically free jazz stuff uh but i was a lot into metal as well like early hey. 90s yeah, and tomb, napalm death, like yeah, all the yeah. stuff, you know. And yeah. of course, in Scandinavia, we have the the best metal shop there is in Scandinavia, uh, sound pollution. Yeah. And Kalle Forsheven importing records and blah blah blah. So we started to trade because he heard about Bratzmann and John Sorn. Ah, cool. We started to trade. So I, I gave him this that shit, and he gave me like and tomb the napalm death records. So we start ah. we started to sell. At Harold's shop, some extreme no. metal and trash metal. 
but there was no no one was interested. They only wanted the jazz stuff. Yeah. But yeah, you know, there was this connection exactly you know, like pushing it. pushing sort of the boundaries, pushing the limit of what is yeah. music because we we are so we are so fast on grouping music in sort of genres. And I think it's it's a shame, really, because they have so much no, in label, common. Yeah. No, labeling music is a terror, because yeah. that I experience this all the time. You know, someone asked me, you you know, you go for dinner with friends or whatever. Ah, oh, so what do you do? Yeah, I play music. Ah, oh, what kind of music? Jazz. Oh, you know, <laughs> or you say experimental music, even worse, or noise, yeah. and yeah. They, they they run away. So <laughs> I never really wanted tell what I do, it's better they come and listen, you know, and make up their mind. They don't have to like it, but no. I expect people to at least give it a chance, you know, yeah. to open up. But as soon as you say and you're playing saxophone, oh, jazz, you know, but I don't really see myself as a jazz player. I see myself as a saxophone player. Yeah, know? yeah. yeah. Uh, That's important. I read, I read, um, because uh, I think it's interesting to to uh, talk in other genres also, and and I saw in the uh, Discoholics book that you uh, uh, talk, you, oh, you had okay. this on one of the lists, and and I, I thought that was awesome because I can see similarities in your music uh, wh when it comes to Karen Dalton also uh, definitely having her own voice and wanting to express herself, uh, and this is this dark shit, isn't it? No, it, it's it's amazing. And the funny thing is that, that was Harold's favorite. Ah, okay. And his favorite track, if you go on YouTube and, and search, it hurts me too. Yeah. There's a version on YouTube which is mind blowing. It's uh -huh. like and he played it for every customer coming into the shop. He played this version for them. It... And now we my group the end, we haven't we even did a, a version of this piece. Oh ah, okay for the last studio album we did. Now Karen Dalton is so great, fantastic. Tragic life. But yeah, tragic I mean, life. the music yeah. was fantastic. Like many, many suffering artists. Yeah, yeah be be before we uh, continue, when will volume two come out? <laughs> <laughs> we need it's it. Cool. I I'm actually I yeah thanks man. Uh, I'm in actually in touch with uh, Lasse Marhaug uh, right now. Okay. The last couple of weeks, we're discussing the volume two. So mm -hmm. we're actually, I have a whole bunch of the interviews, but I will need to do some more. And then yep. it, it will happen. I mean, yep. next year, I guess. It's yeah. an awesome book. So, and, and I love the single also that came with it. So, so uh, yeah, uh, just. Uh, oh, I, I like I like making books. It's uh, yeah. I, I start. I actually started to collect. I don't know if collect, but gathering like music books. I I um, yeah. I had like uh, improvisation with uh, Derek Bailey. I, I got that, and that started off like getting the uh, let's see here, like the book on uh, on Iskra. Um, yeah, yeah. And, no, and the Gulin and Riedel and yeah, so I've been sort of absorbing books lately. I love it. <laughs> awesome. But it, it it's a funny contradiction in a way now when we have so much access to so much information online. Yep. Uh, and before internet, actually there was not very many books about no. music, especially about creative music or impressed music. Very very few. Yeah. Uh, European or American or Japanese, but right now it's like an explosion. The last ten years, right. there's shitloads of publications and really, really great books too. Yeah. Really interesting books. Uh, so uh, I'm a sucker for that too. Uh, I try to buy as much as I can to read yeah. as much as I can because there's so much information available. Yeah, definitely in, in those books. Yeah. Uh, I bought the Börje Fredriksson book. I thought that was awesome because uh, people I talk with in, in this sort of vinyl community abroad, they have no idea who Börje Fredriksson is. So just, I mean, compiling a book about his life is just like, we really needed it. But uh, uh, yeah, it's just it's awesome. a great, book. It's it's a great, great time book. to be alive. Yeah. yeah. Really, yeah. And that's another, there's quite a few of those Swedish, all saxophone, but... Uh, 
jazz musicians in the 60s that was uh, having drug problems, you know, yep. uh, or mental problems. And there's quite a few that only made like one record or didn't even make any records at all. Uh, so it's, it's very important now to be able to put those names back in, in, in the legacy where they belong, you know? Yeah. So that's, uh, for me, that's very important. And also something I'm, I'm working on actively now uh, with a label in Sweden to make reissues from uh, the, the Swedish jazz archives, basically. Okay. Because there's a lot, a lot, a lot of forgotten stuff that no one ever heard about. Like uh, Buddy Fredersson, at least he made a record during his lifetime, but there's a lot of other names that never did anything. Mm. And it's, yeah, it keeps on surprising me, you know, when you start to go into archival stuff too, not not just in Sweden, everywhere. I mean, there's so much stuff still laying around. I mean, there was yeah. a lot of stuff being thrown away in the 60s and 70s, radio, TV, blah, blah, blah. But there's still a lot sitting there. And I I feel it's our duty to to, to make it available, you know? Yeah. It's almost like uh, with your acetates there, it's almost like an archaeology more than, than discology, <laughs> you know, in a way, <laughs> digging this up like yeah. this old dinosaurs um, giving it to the world. Like I, I, I thought of yeah. like when we when we post this, I, I've thought of like what what where sort of my where I went the furthest when it comes to sort of the vinyl medium. And I think that this is one of those records that I, it's fascinating. Like this is Charles Manson's um, life record, but it's the, um, I think it's the Spanish press or Brazilian press of it. So it's not even the, yeah. the, the, the U S press. It's the <laughs> Brazilian press from the same year. Um, and I don't know. I think it's good, but it is it when does sort of this collecting records go too far, if you know what I mean? When <laughs> does it get unhealthy? <laughs> it's up to you, of course. Uh, but for me, I mean, of course, there's objects that are not where the content is not good or so interesting yeah. but it's still yeah. the object is, itself has a strong connection to the time when it was done yeah makes it important and interesting for me and uh, i have a bunch of those records where i find the music is not really kick ass but there's a historical or musical importance That's of good. the record that means something and that makes my archive wider and deeper yeah and therefore i keep them but the day when i start to sell off stuff that's the records that will go first okay yeah for sure uh, because it's still i i it needs to be great it needs to be ass or mind kicking in yeah. in one way or that uh, and then I, I love the work of, of the process of getting that record that I really want. Uh, I mean, I have an ongoing trade with a guy in Japan. The record is like number one on my want list. And I've been working for three years now to try to convince him to trade it. For okay. me. And he, he is not with me yet. <laughs> okay. But it's a process. Yeah. It's a process. It might happen, but... Uh, not today. What's what's your like top five want list items like on top of your mind? Uh, what's still there to do? No, I mean that record. That, that's a Milford Graves Don Pullen duo. Okay. With a handmade cover, uh, it's a, a duo drums and piano live recording from '66, I believe, and the music is absolutely fantastic. There is a second and a third pressing of it. I have the music, yes. But I want the first yeah. edition, you know. Yeah, obviously, and it's a very rare record, and the price is just going insane. But uh, that one I need. I mean, there, there's a lot I need. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but with free jazz and and free price music, I have most of the holy grails. I think. Hmm. 
there's not many of those really, really heavy, great mu music records that I don't have. Like that's that's one of them that I really need. There's a lot of Japanese stuff that is insanely rare, insanely expensive, and insanely great. Yeah. Uh, that I keep looking for, but for me, it's it's. Uh, I'm very happy with the jazz collection I have. I can always make it. I I, I can. Uh, I can always trim my garden, as Lasse Marhog expressed it. But I I look for a lot of garage stuff and and okay. like early psychedelic music because that's I don't have as much and I don't know as much. Okay. Uh, so I'm dying to find out more. Uh, ah. But of course, also like garage slash psychedelic music is it's uh, also a, a price problem you know because yeah. a lot of those great records are really expensive but on the other hand trading is still yeah. a possibility and then, then i can do it <laughs> yeah, I, I i bought bought a lot of the, the sort of the core stuff like uh, rolling stones and and beatles and and stuff like that like 15 years ago uh, when I started to really absorb records and uh, I find myself like trading those off because I bought them for like uh, one, two euro, like 10, 20 Swedish crowns back then. And now yeah, yeah. they go for a little bit more. And if you sell like 10 or 15 of those, you can get a really good record for those th that type of money. So, so. I feel that's the way I have to go. And buying collections also. I've, I've been buying some jazz collections and it feels like one of the ways to find good stuff nowadays for not too much. You can sell off some of the, the stuff that you don't keep, but it's hard to, to find. Yeah, I mean, th there's a continuous problem. I mean, for shops and for us, private discoholics, yeah. Uh, it's great to buy a collection, but it's so hard to find one. Yeah, it's almost impossible to find a collection for sale. You need to know people or have contacts. And uh, I'm I'm fortunate because people knows about my habits and I know what I collect. And I've been helping when musicians have been dying. Uh, I have been helping families to sell collections. Or to put it in on on my auction and you know stuff. So I feel very happy that I can actually help yeah. in in that way. Yeah. But you have to be uh, careful, and I mean not pushing it and not using this situation because it's a it's a weird situation when someone is is passing. Yeah, I had a friend. And, 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 you know, that's it's a bad yeah. karma. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, ha I had a friend who passed just six months ago and he had a, a pretty nice record collection. So I helped the family to to sell uh, the stuff that I, I didn't buy. I bought, bought some stuff just to to keep in my my collection. So a part of him lives in the shelves now. And I think that that's a great sort of tribute to to the guy. Um, no, but it's, yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, I, I have some of Harold's records. And I have some of Lennart Nilsson's records, who was this producer in Westeros. We did some uh, experimental music festivals together and with some productions and blah, blah, blah. And he passed away half a year ago. Uh, as I have a, some of his old records with his uh, signature on, yeah. they mean everything to me. Yeah. You know, Priceless. some of them are not worth anything, but they mean everything to me because it's his, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's that, that makes it really. Awesome way of, of remembering uh, and also sort of paying tribute to the, the persons around you, I guess. Yeah, uh, it, give, it gives a certain value to the to the object, you know, the, because we were talking about objects too, yeah. you know, but yeah. objects means something and, and objects makes me feel good, you know, that's, uh, and if, if the music is also great, then it's bingo, you know. Yeah. Uh, I talked with Magnus uh, Nygren, uh, uh, who was the chief editor of uh, Orchester Journalen, and we got hung up on this one. Do, do you know uh, this one? Uh, I think it comes with different cover uh, covers, and and we we yeah. we talked a little bit about Don Cherry's involvement with this because if you read on the backside, Don Cherry isn't on any of the songs. 
playing on any of the songs, but he's on the the front. So do, do you know the the story of that? Was was there any like involvement or sessions or or recordings that he went on, but it, it is was... not record? No, it was the same pool of musicians. I mean, the, the early 60s in New York, and a lot was built around Cecil, of course. Yep. Uh, but Don Cherry came in, Onet Coleman came in, Shep was there. I mean, it was like a melting pot. So there's, there's a lot of collaborations between all those musicians. And some of those records are classic, and some are forgotten. But yep. uh, that, that's, I mean, for me, that period, like early 60s, is maybe the most interesting period when it comes to free jazz, because that's when it was born. That's where where they found out what they could actually do. And they were trying to break the rules they were setting up yeah. initially. And then fucking everything up and turning it around and blah, blah, blah. And that's always for me, and Harold agreed very much. We talked a lot about this because that goes for all periods in jazz. The beginning, when things get are formalized, where, where the standard is set up, you can feel how eager the musicians are to do the research, and that creates a certain friction, a certain energy, and it's, it's just amazing, like the early bebop, with Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, yep. Yep. killing music, but also like the early New Orleans stuff, mm. as far back as you can go with recordings with Bank Johnson, yep. George Lewis, that shit is kick-ass. It's yep. mind-blowing. And the same yep. for me, it's like the early 60s in, in the US, especially exactly those musicians like Shep, Cecil Taylor, Steve Lacey, Don Cherry, yep. John Chikai came over from, from Denmark. It's mind blowing. It's so great. And then only a few years later, it's something else. It's something different. Okay. It can still be good, but like the early years are always the most exciting. Same thing with like with fusion music, jazz rock. You know, when yeah. Miles changed the whole yeah. thing. You know, yeah. And like early Mahavishnu Orchestra and like uh, all the musicians around Miles. What what where they went? The Herbie Ca Hancock's early stuff. Yes, it's fantastic. But yeah. only a few years later, it goes into, you know. Yes, yes. Um, wank wank elevator music. I almost picked yeah, uh, my Vision Orchestra record, but I thought that uh, maybe you, you. Um, but but I love early my Vision Orchestra. I think it's it's like. That's the shit. It's the shit. Yeah, yeah. That, that was also something that that com that they got those world together for me, like jazz and punk rock. Yep. So in in like in the Mountain Flame, for instance, which yes. is a masterpiece, yeah. it sounds like shitty, trashy punk rock in a yes. way, but it isn't, you know. And no, I no, no, it no. completely clicked when I heard it, and that's one of my top ten records in my life, you know. Ah, cool. That completely fantastic. I, I told my wife that uh, if I die, she 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 have to play one word on my funeral because no one uh, sitting there in, in, in the chapel will, will like what they are hearing and they have to hear it for like 12 minutes or whatever. It's, I think it's like, yeah, 10, 12 minutes, something like that. So, so um, That's yeah. That's good. I, I, might, I might steal that idea. That's good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I don't know. Do you have any records to, to uh, show and, and talk about or should I continue? <laughs> I have I have a bunch. There's always records to talk about. I mean, I when you asked me if I would be willing to show some records, of course. I mean, it's it's fun because it it also uh, can make people curious and try to look for stuff and blah blah blah. Okay. And why is he collecting that and blah blah blah. Yeah. Uh, so of course it gets a bit ridiculous when you start to have multiple copies of one album. You know. And one one of my absolute favorite records of all time is the Albert Eiler Bells. Yes, which is only a one-sided record, which yep. is interesting because the, the 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 other side of the vinyl is a, a silk screen. 
and it's beautiful you know it's this, this awesome is, and they, they're all unique you know the colors are all unique and it's very collectible because also also the covers black and yellow this is black and white yeah. white and red this like all these variations and i can't get enough i'm stupid i know i'm no, sick, but but yeah. i love i love collecting this shit and there's one pre-edition of this record. Okay. Where they actually made ah. the cover, the print on a metal no foil. Way. Shit. And this is like 50 copies only as a pre-press. So there's mm. this is silver, but there's also like a copper colored one. Okay. So this is like holy grails. But to top that, before, <laughs> before the pre-edition, this version came and I'm not sure if you can see it, but this is on, on the plastic. This is painted. Okay. This is not the print. This is painted. So this is the original painting of bells. No way. With a test it, pressing. Inside. I get goosebumps. It, <laughs> it's insane. And I, I can't believe how lucky I am to actually, I got this because no one really understood what it was. And I, I understood what it was when I got it because I could see it's not a print, it's a painting, you know. Yeah. It's the original painting. And then recently, let's see, I have like 20 different versions of this fucking record. Recently I got this and this is really, this is really funny. This is quite punk to me. <laughs> it's shit if you don't like Bells by <laughs> Albert Eiler. Ah. And it, it's a great present. It's, it's like... Something is weird with the mix or the mastering. It doesn't yeah. sound like the others. Huh. It is, it's the same music, but it's just a slight different mix. Okay. Because, but I, I love it because it's obviously made in the mid 60s too, yeah. you know, each year. So awesome. that's kind of fun. But but yeah, and I have I have so much respect for for uh, collecting di different uh, pr pressing of the same uh, sort of, because it's an artifact. It's like uh, it's it's not it's not only music. It's fantastic music, but it's not only music. It's an artifact. It's something that that it's a piece of art. And if when you have it together, uh, yeah, it, it becomes something else. It becomes sure. something yeah. else. Exactly, it becomes something else. It's interesting because I did, in the course of four four years, I I actually did. I was part of two different uh, art exhibitions at art museums, showing record covers. So okay, like my collection okay. of Albert Eiler Bells has been traveling there. Uh, a collection of like the weirdest Sun Ra covers. Oh. You know, I have. Those total holy grails, ah, cool. the Sun Ra Shit. shower curtain covers, which everyone wants and everyone needs for a reason because they look so fucking cool. I'm so glad that I haven't gone down the rabbit hole of, of Sun Ra yet because it's it's going to be, uh, and I'm going to fall so far down. It's, it's, oh, uh, the so. prices are ridiculous. There was an auction on eBay that ended this morning. And the prices, I mean, for the old Saturn stuff, they were like between two and four and a half thousand euro each record. So it's, uh, I mean, I can still trade, but then you need to have something really great to trade yeah. with yeah. For, for that kind of value. I'm happy because I have almost all I need from Sun Ra. I mean, I have all the seven inches and I have most of the, the 12 inches, but there's, of course, there's always shit you don't have i mean yeah, there's one, one of his the first seven inch he put out which has a track called saturn there's only three known copies in the world of that one that one i have that's, 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 a, good, that's a good that's a good feeling uh, i bet it is I bet you know, and, and that for me, it's 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 a of course it's about the music but it's also about the feeling it's about me feeling good when i yeah. i take that sun raw where do I have it? I, I take the sound raw seven inch out. Uh, here it is. Sound raw. 
Saturn. Awesome. I take it out, I put it on a turntable, yeah. I sit in this chair, yeah. and I smile. Yeah. It makes me it makes me feel good. It makes me feel very good, you know. Do do you have do you have any like plans for your collection? I I, I I'm I'm hugely into Ingmar Bergman just uh, right now. Uh, I'm a I, I worked in in film and I have some some years in in film school uh, for film theory. So I have this periods when I can't get enough of Bergman. Um, and I remember when the when he passed away, uh, Swedish Television made something of his uh, film collection. He, he collected sort of uh, VHS tapes, and uh, they went through and found some stuff that they never thought that Berman had, like uh, Karate Kid 2, like <laughs> something like that in Berman's <laughs> uh, collection. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was there were some super surprises, like just imagining him sitting in a chair and then watching these videos. Um, but this is a great image. <laughs> yeah, it's a great image. Um, but but uh, I mean, the collection that you have, do you have any like plans for it or, or do you, is there any like I don't know where I'm getting with this, but but I mean, there will be a time when you're not here. What will happen no, for sure. with I mean, the collection? This, this is this happens all the time, and and I get asked by colleagues, you know, uh, if if I can help, you know, if they would pass away, and it's a kind of a weird situation because I don't want them to pass away. But no, I also want to tell them. And their family said, I can help. Of course, I can help because I have the knowledge. I have my network. I have my annual auction. You know, I can I can help, you know, but <laughs> I don't want them to pass away. You no, know? no, so no, no, obviously. But and no, no one I wants you to pass away either. But but I mean, you have well, records that are priceless. I mean, they are they they are you have a museum where you are sitting and it's maybe maybe in one way it's even bigger than uh, the person itself if you understand what i mean this it's not human what you have behind you there's some good stuff around, yeah but uh, you know uh it is an important question i mean the the collection the, there will be a day when i start to sell sell sh stuff off i'm not there no yet, no no I, I love no. Well, obviously and you were young so it was, it was a great interesting great uh, and good situation uh, also in a way a mentor for me and a huge inspiration Stan Hanson okay who was working at the electronic music studio in Stockholm he was the chairman of uh, uh, the as association of composers and all that and he may he was also a performance artist composer fantastic stuff and uh, also huge collector oh. of books avant-garde books especially you know okay. all kinds of avant-garde poetry and uh, artist books all kinds of stuff uh, huge collection but also collection huge collection of Gunnar Ekelöv and yep. uh, Swedish authors from the end of 19th century and stuff like this huge library and he before he died he started to sell off and okay. this antiquarian bookshop, which is a fantastic place where I go up to work now <laughs> this week, Renell's. Yeah, Renell's they made yeah. A, institution. It's absolutely fantastic. And they made a catalog. Oh, okay. With his stuff. Uh, and I was it in connection with another shop, Hundarat. Uh, I mix things up now. Anyway, there, there was a catalog made of his books. Okay. Uh, and he was took active part in selling his own collection because he knew the value better than anyone else. Yeah, and he also wanted certain books to be with certain collectors yeah. and certain people, and then you can control it. Uh, so I would, I could see that happen, you know, at a certain point, yeah. that I could take care of it myself in a way because I don't. I have three daughters, and none of them are like <laughs> yet. Son raw seven three. inches yet? No, maybe not yet. But who who knows what happens? But yep, definitely. I, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to put this on them. You know. Oh. 
if I pass away, they have no idea what how to do it, and and it's so easy to get fucked over yeah. by yeah. shops and collectors that are just greedy and want to blah blah. So it is good to have a plan, you know, what, how to do it. I think one one aspect of my collection is that I have a bit too many unique things, like the the bird note uh, archive yep. with the metal uh, masters and all these acetates and stuff, which is unique copies. Yep. This needs to go into an archive. Yep. This needs, it's worth shitloads of money, of course, but that needs to be in an archive to be able to do research and study the music and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I have, I have stuff like this, which is impossible to put a price on. Uh, you know, there's an Onet Coleman record on ESP. Yeah. Live at Town Hall. Fantastic record. This record, this is the pre press of that record, different cover. So, this is very rare. 50 Shit. copies. Fantastic. Awesome. With the letter awesome cover. On. Fantastic. But th this is nothing compared to what I'm going to tell you. Because this recording was set up by Blue Note. Ah, no way. And it was, there's even a Blue Note catalog number. Ha! So the recording was made at Town Hall. Yeah. Isenson, Moffat, or that, this classic trio, fantastic trio, the Ornette Coleman trio, that trio. Yep. And then there was, everyone was happy with the music and the sound and everything. There was some legal issues. And I don't, I don't know the details. I don't know if I want to know the details, but they did not release the record with Blue Note. Ah. So they reject, they reject that Onet took out the, the bad, the bad stuff yep, went the into this EP record, which ah. we love because it's fantastic. But the good stuff was kept in the vault until early seventies where Blue Note, who had invested money in this recording, wanted to try again. So they made a test pressing ha. of the original material, Shit. mixed and mastered, and gave to UNET. And again, there was legal issues. Yeah. So the, the record never came out. The, the catalog number is still there, never came out. And now, this is the test pressings, the Blue Note test pressings. And the sound is absolutely insane. The music is beyond good. It's some of the best shit that Onet Coleman ever, ever recorded. Yeah. It's a long yeah. story how I got those. Uh, I have them in my archive. I don't hardly dare to play I, them yeah. because acetates should, should be transferred and yes. I will do that. <laughs> I will do that for sure. So stuff like this, you can't even put a price on that shit. And that should not be on the commercial market. That that should be in an archive, no, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the, the the bad thing for, for Blow Note is that those master tapes went up in that big, you know, that warehouse yeah, fire. fire. Was, yeah, fire. Yeah. Gone. So the only copies there are, there, are, there might be another set of this acetate somewhere. They made they made maybe they did two or three sets. I don't know. No. I have one set of this at least. So someday someone should do something with <laughs> with it. Yeah, <laughs> with yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Insane, you know. But it, it would be it would be bad to to try to sell anything like that, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Bad karma. Um I'll 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 wrap this up i'll I'll let you go because i i'm so <laughs> glad that you made the time to to talk to me um and showing us the the records um yeah it, yeah i'm 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 speechless i don't have any words uh thank you so much uh Mats, for uh <laughs> thanks man just fun yeah let's uh, meet up someday in the record shop yeah definitely we'll do that <laughs> so thank you so much bye <laughs>